Hey guys, today I want to talk about a little bit kind of the first steps that somebody is going to take when they start coming into covenant with Yahweh. So what does that look like? And you know, whenever we read the Bible, we read a, a few different things. There's, there's really not a step-by-step -step guide in there that says this is what your walk's going to look like. You know, we can go back and we can look at the Hebrews coming out of Egypt. That gives us a good example. We can look at Messiah when he was beginning his ministry. That gives us a pretty good example. We can look at Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost. There are a handful of things. We can look at the story of Noah um, that, that exemplify what it means and what it looks like when we go from living our own lives to living for Yahweh. Um, and that gives us the pattern. And then we can study the commandments and we can learn the expectations of our God and we can do those things and eventually we're going to check all the boxes. But what we don't have is that step one, step two guide anywhere in the Bible. And the fact is, you know, it's not quite that simple. Sometimes some of those steps happen in different orders. They don't, uh, they don't follow the same sequence every time. So I'm going to give you just a plain English kind of description of what happens whenever we come into covenant with Yahweh what that process looked like, what the steps are. And yes, I grant you, maybe some of the steps are going to happen in a different order in your life than they did in mine, but that's okay. You will see these same steps in the lives of all of the believers, even if they don't all look exactly the same and even if they don't happen in the same order. So what happens? Um, here I am today and I'm living for myself. I'm what's called a hedonist uh, or a humanist. I'm seeking pleasure. I'm seeking gratification. I'm seeking to satisfy and exalt the self, and there is nothing above me. And then, all of a sudden, fast forward a year or fast forward five years, now I'm a child of the King. I'm a servant of Yahweh. I'm a citizen of the nation of faith that's called Israel and I am obeying His laws on a daily basis. What, what was the path between point A and point B? And that's what I want to talk about. So, the first thing that happens is belief. Okay? How can I live for a God if I don't believe that there is one? So, the first thing that happens is I decide that I believe that for whatever reason there is a God and it is the God of the Bible. Therefore, I believe that the Bible has merit as an instruction manual of that God in which I also believe. So, I've got the belief box checked. The next step is, and that's tangent to that belief, is faith. I decide that not only is the Bible real, not only is there a real God inspiring that Bible, but I decide to trust in what that book says. Now, a man's going to come along and a religion's going to come along. A church organization is going to tell me something different. Paul, he doesn't want those things that he said he wanted in the Bible anymore. That was just for a different people. Today, it's something else. For you and me, he, he has a different set of expectations. Okay, I'm not going to put my faith in that man. I'm going to put my faith in that Bible that I also believe in. And I'm going to put my trust in His Word. God, you said you wanted this? Okay, that's what I'm going to do. This clown over here is telling me you want something else, but I'm not going to put my faith in him. I'm going to put my faith in you. You said A, I'm going to give you A. If that's changed, you better say something because I'm taking you at your word, okay? That's what faith is, boys and girls. It's confidence. So, I believe, then I have faith. What happens next? Next, I realize that, you know what, there's a difference between my life and the life that this God in the Bible says that He wants me to live. I'm not 
acceptable to him. Now, you remember in, in your days in the church, they told you that you need to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Oh no, it's not about you accepting Him. It's about you becoming acceptable to Yahweh. Okay? So, our God and our Messiah, they're already acceptable. They're perfectly acceptable whether you think you accept them or not. Now we're talking about you becoming acceptable to them. And, you know, that's not something you earn. That's not something that, oh, I'm, I'm going to you know, work and work and work until all of a sudden they love me? Oh, come on now. You know, that's, that's elementary school stuff, boys and girls. We know better than that. What is it? Well, it's that faith. That faith, that confidence causes you to do something. When you recognize there's a difference between where you're at and where you're expected to be, what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden? They ate from the tree of, you know, the knowledge of good and evil. They ate that fruit and all of a sudden they knew what was right and what was wrong. They knew his laws. And when he came knocking and he said, hey, Adam, Eve, where are you guys at? They said, ah, we're naked. <laughs> he wants us to be here, but we're there. So they ran and covered up. Okay, now we're where we're supposed to be. Hey, here we are. We're cool now. We're covered up. Okay. Well, that is called repentance, all right? They realized they were not where they were supposed to be, so they took active steps to get where they were supposed to be. They changed. The second they realized they were wrong, they made corrections. And that's what faith makes us do. When we realize we're on the wrong path, we say, you know what? I don't care what it takes to get on the right path. I don't even see the whole path clearly. I don't know what all of his expectations are yet, man. I just walked in the door. But whatever it is, I'm going to find it and I'm going to get on it. Whatever I have to change, I'm going to change it. Whatever he wants from me, that's what I'm going to give him. If it costs me, it costs me. If I lose something, I lose something. But I've decided that I'm going to be his child. He's going to be my God. And whatever it takes, whatever I find in my book, in my Bible, whatever he says, I want this from you, that's what I'm going to do. That's repentance. And that's the next step. That's where we've got to get to. We've got to make that decision that we want to be his. We want him to rule over us. And we're going to follow him wherever that may be. Now, next step. We're dirty, okay? We're guilty. We are sinful creatures. You're a bad girl. I'm a bad boy. Maybe you're a bad boy. I don't know. But, you know, we've got this long list of offenses. And no matter what we do from here on out, our sentence is death. We've earned that death sentence every single time we went to work on a Sabbath day. We earned that death sentence every time we did one of a hundred different things that we've probably been doing for years. You and I deserve to die. And you know what? At this point, it's time to pay the piper. That's all that we can do. Um, the sentence is warranted and it's going to be executed. But you know what? It's not as gruesome as it sounds because the way that we die is in baptism. And yeah, I know some people are allergic to the term baptism. They want to say immersion or something. Okay, you know, I'm just going to use common English language that we've all learned in Christianity that it, you know, uses in our New Testament in our Bible. So, you know, forgive me if I use a Greek kind of word here, but, you know, it's not the devil, I assure you. Um, the Bible says, New Testament says, when we are baptized with Messiah, we are buried with Him. And what happens after you die? Well, you, we don't stay dead. Neither did He. When Messiah died, He rose again. And in this case, when we die, we, our spirit is dead, but we receive a new spirit. Ever heard of that thing called the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit? That's what we're talking about here. We are given a new spirit that comes into us. We are born again, and now, hey, 
we are innocent once again. We have clean slates. We're like newborn babies, born without sin, and it's a beautiful thing. So, you know, you get your certificate of revirgination. You are a brand new creature. You are a citizen of a new nation. You have a new mother. You have a new father. You have new brethren. Everything is brand new. And now the difference is, you know a few things. You've decided, you know what, that last life, uh, that guy, he was living for himself. Me, I'm something new though, and I don't live for myself. I have a God. I have a king over me. I'm a servant. I live for him now. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that every day and all day all you're doing is, you know, Bible things and religious services and, you know, preaching in the streets. And it doesn't mean that. It means that as a citizen of this country, you've got a law that's above you. And you can do what you want. You're still alive. You're still a man. You're still a woman. You're still a father or a mother or, you know, an employee or everything you were before. But now, you answer to somebody. Now you have some guidelines put on top of you how you live. You don't know them all yet, okay? You're still, you just walked in the door. You're under this thing called grace. So what does that mean? Well, you've, you've put on, you know, this new life. You're this new creature and you start walking and you say, you know what? Everything that I'm supposed to do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Everything I've been taught, I'm going to obey. But you're still going to make some mistakes in ignorance because you just don't know everything yet. So, you know, you're going to be walking along and, oh, I know I'm not supposed to work on the seventh day. Oh, I know I'm not supposed to murder my brother. So I'm mad at you today, but I'm not going to kill you and I don't hate you. Okay, you know, I'm doing pretty good. Lunchtime, yeah, I'll have the elephant soup, please. And you're sitting there chowing along, and then somebody walks by and say, Mmm, smells yummy, what is it? And you're like, oh, it's delicious, it's elephant. Here, try some. Oh, dude, you're not supposed to be eating that, man, that's unclean meat. Oh, oh, I didn't know. You know what? Have you sinned? Yes, 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 you did. You broke the law, you broke Torah. But... You didn't sin willfully. It's not an act of rebellion. You're a brand new baby and you're under this thing called grace. You are covered by Messiah's sacrifice. It was a Passover sacrifice. Okay, it buys you a reprieve from impending judgment. Yay! <laughs> but, you know, what do you do now? Do you say, hey, I'm under grace. I can eat this elephant soup if I want to. All's forgiven. I'm a newbie. No. <laughs> It, it helps you in your ignorance. It doesn't help you in your rebellion. Once you realize, you know, I'm not supposed to be eating this. You put the spoon down, you clean off your mouth, and you say, I'm sorry. Won't do that again. Okay? And you move forward. That's what grace is all about. It's your learning period. Now, what's next? Eventually, you get to a point where you know what's expected of you. You know the commandments. You know Torah. Now, here's where some guy with a big long beard comes in and says, if you can study Torah your whole life and you're never going to understand it all, it's got profound depths of knowledge and wisdom that in two lifetimes a person will never discover, blah, blah, blah. Yes, 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 it's true. Torah is profound, yes. There's a lot of wisdom in there, yes. There's a lot of knowledge in there that you're never going to unlock in your life. I, yes, that's all true. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is there comes a point when you know how to wake up in the morning and make it through the day without sinning against your God, okay? And when you get to that point, now you're ready to be an adult in this new kingdom. Now you're not a newborn baby anymore. You're somebody who knows the commandments, knows the expectations, and you can be a productive member of this new society, and you can help others and guide them along the way, and, you know, you can do so without making mistakes and, you know, without, you know, speaking in ignorance. When you get to that point, that's what I'm talking about here. Now 
you're ready to walk in the fullness of this covenant. Now we can take the training wheels off the bike. Now you don't, you're not in this grace period anymore. So this is the point where, boys, you can get circumcised now if you aren't already. Oh, it doesn't sound very good, right? Okay, yeah, it's kind of a bummer, but it's part of our law. It's part of our way. It's what our God wants from us as a sign that we are now walking in full covenant with Him as right-standing members of Israel, as adults in His kingdom. And that is basically the journey. That's it from start to finish. You know what? I was circumcised at birth, as is customary in the United States. So that step kind of came out of order for me, didn't it? And, you know, there, there were probably a few other steps that got jumbled up along the way too. That's okay. In the end, I got my boxes checked. And the most important thing of this whole thing, and this is where Christianity gets confused, or rather likes to try to confuse you, is that the most important thing is not that my flesh is circumcised. That's just an outward sign that I'm in a covenant with Him. But the real thing is here, my heart is circumcised. And that's not a New Testament doctrine, that's an Old Testament doctrine as well. Um, I am contrite before my God for the things that I've done in my past. I have turned away from that. I don't live outside of His law anymore. I don't rebel against His commandments anymore. Now that I know what my God wants of me, that's how I live when the Bible says Torah is life, that's not some spiritual metaphor, okay? That's not some poetic expression of affection for Torah. When it says Torah is life, what that is telling you is this is our lifestyle. This is how we live on a daily basis. It describes my life every day. I wake up in the morning, I keep Torah. Uh, all afternoon, I keep Torah. When the sun sets, there I am, wherever I am, I'm keeping Torah. Okay, Torah, His instructions, His laws, I obey them. I am His servant, and this is what I do, and that's my daily life. Yes, I also do my sports, and yes, I also play games, and you know, yes, I spend time with my wife, and I go out to restaurants, and I go on shopping sprees. I do all the same stuff that normal people do, but I do it while obeying Torah. I don't do things that sin against His law. I don't break His law. I stay within the bounds of His commandments. So that's it. That is the basic journey. When somebody who doesn't know Yahweh, doesn't know His commandments, doesn't know anything, all of a sudden, you know, decides, hey, that's what I want, that's where I need to be, that's the path, that's the way that we get there. And the last piece of this puzzle that I will mention that I want to talk about just because it's something that you'll see is, you know, there are people that come up and they'll see your blessings and they'll say, you're blessed and I realize it's because you keep this thing called Torah. Therefore, I too want to keep Torah because I also want to be blessed. Good luck with that. Okay? Um, the law does not bless a person. Keeping the law, okay, hear me out here because there's some people that are going to jump down my throat for saying this. Obeying the law of God does not earn a person blessings. It doesn't. It's not a recipe for blessings. It's not a magic spell that if you do this and do this, everything's going to go well in your life. Okay? Our God does not bless people on their behavior. He blesses His obedient children. Okay, understand that for a second. If somebody who doesn't love our God, who doesn't 
love the people of our God all of a sudden starts, you know, abstaining from unclean meats and, and resting on Sabbaths, guess what? That doesn't matter. It doesn't affect anything. That doesn't earn you blessings. That's not how this thing works. If you think it does, you should really read this Bible, okay? You should really get into that and understand the letter of the law is not a magic formula. The spirit of the law is what it's all about. It's that thing that the letter of the law, our obedience, is supposed to be teaching us. That is love. Okay? There are other people out there that, you know, see these little Torah families popping up around and they say, ah, I want to belong to that. So, you know, they, they want to keep our commandments because they want to be a part of our family. They want to be our brothers and our sisters. Well, that's sweet. You know, that's not a bad thing. But that's also not the purpose, okay? Torah is not uh, admission into a group. Torah is not a recipe for blessings in your life. Torah is the means by which we please the God that we have chosen to serve, okay? The root of our walk is our love for Him and His love for us. It's not about laws. It's not about commandments. It's not about resting on feast days and staying away from Christmas trees. That's not what this thing is about. Um, something that I use as an example is uh, I do Taekwondo. It's kind of my, you know my thing. I like it. And, you know, I don't, I didn't walk in on my first day, go up to the instructor and say, hey, you know, you seem like a pretty tough character. You seem to have a lot of discipline. I think it's because you have a black belt. Therefore, prepare me for the black belt test. I want to take it next week. <laughs> he would laugh himself stupid because even if he prepared me for that test and I walked in and I took it and I passed it, and somebody was dumb enough to wrap a black belt around me, guess what? I don't have what he has, and I've completely missed the point. I don't know how to do anything. I don't understand this martial art. I'm not ready to compete in this sport. My body is not conditioned to practice these techniques and to execute them as intended. You see what I'm saying? You know, that is a part of the process, that exam, wearing that belt. That is, those are steps along the journey. They serve a purpose. They demonstrate aptitude. They demonstrate uh, time and experience. But they, in and of themselves, aren't anything. That exam isn't anything. That belt is just fabric. Torah Torah is just some rules, okay? That's all it is. And for those of us who love Torah, hearing me talk about it in a somewhat deprecating manner, ooh, that, that's kind of unsettling. It's like, don't say Torah is just rules. It's so much more than that, Paul. Yes, it is. But not for somebody who doesn't serve our God. Torah is not anything. Torah doesn't earn you salvation. It doesn't earn you blessings. It doesn't earn you a better life. It doesn't benefit you unless you are doing it with the right heart. Unless your intent is to love Yahweh and to serve Him and to be His child and to please Him, your obedience to Torah doesn't amount to anything. Okay? So, Keep that in mind. It's great you want to keep Torah. It's great that you are interested in these commandments. But search your heart and ask yourself, why are you doing it? Is it for blessings? I suspect you won't see them. Is it to be a part of a community? I suspect in a few years you'll drift away and you won't be in that community anymore. Is it because you feel a calling to belong to our Creator and to serve Him and no matter what, to do His will, 
then I think you've probably got a long and prosperous walk ahead of you. So you know what? That's it. That's all I want to say. The first steps, that's where most of us go. That's where the journey takes us when we set our foot along this path and you know from then on that's kind of how this thing looks so anybody who's coming into this thing and who's brand new and who really doesn't know where they're at doesn't know where they should be you know take this little talk uh, keep it in mind look it up in the bible see if what i said kind of makes sense see if you can see this pattern in the lives of the patriarchs and in messiah's life and in the new testament you know, see if it holds water. And if it does, okay, hey, you know, maybe you've got a little bit more insight into what lies ahead and where you should be and what you should be doing. If not, well, I get, you know, sorry for wasting your time. I guess you watched a video for nothing. <laughs> um, but no, I don't think you did. Uh, that's it. That's what I've got. I hope it's a help. And, you know, if you know somebody who's coming into this thing and who's brand new, um, if if you think that this makes sense and you think this would be a benefit to them, by all means, pass them a link, share it with them. Maybe it'll help. So until next time, take care.